Awesome. So um, let's get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a good uh, day two of PowerShell Summit. Um, I know it's one of my favorite conferences of the year, probably my favorite conference of the year. So I uh, hope you're getting a lot out of this. Uh, and uh, do we have on-ramp folks in the room as well? Raise your hand. Awesome. Great, great. I, I kind of kind of jealous. I wish I was in your your place. You know, experiencing all this stuff for the first time. It's so exciting and new. So like. Uh, Definitely, like uh, drink it all in as you can. Uh, it, it's it's a fun conference and a, and a good group of folks. So, uh, let's get started. So, my talk is called PowerShell and ne your next career steps. Oh, the places you'll go. Um, so, let's cover the agenda first of all, just so y'all know what you're getting into today. Um, uh, I'll start by introducing myself a little bit uh, and my PowerShell journey uh, in order to give you some context of where I'm coming from. Um, then we'll cover uh, the how and when to start making a career transition or making a change uh, up uh, or, or moving on to the next role. Um, we'll also cover some normal career objections and, uh, that you might come up against uh, sort of when you're going through this process, uh, and many of which I've been guilty of myself. Don't feel bad, that's normal. It's part of the process uh, and ways to solve for them. Uh, so then I'll touch on um, some skills that you may have already picked up as a PowerSheller uh, that may translate to other roles. Um, uh, you know, that, that'll be helpful. Uh, and then if we have time, I'll talk about what I do as a solution engineer, one of the roles that you may not necessarily think about first. Uh, if we have time, um, I've done the time check and I've ran this a few times, so I tend to go a little bit over, so we may not touch on that or we may save that for the second part, which is the Q&A. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out as we go together. Uh, and then finally, um, sort of we'll open this up to a panel discussion, so I have some esteemed colleagues here in the PowerShell community who've been with me for many years, and uh, they're going to come up and um, sort of, yeah, they're going to they're come up and uh, help me answer some questions that uh, you may have in the audience uh, and start to talk about their background and give some advice uh, that you might find handy, um, you know, that they wish they knew uh, going into this process as well. So uh, also, um, if you do ask questions during that Q&A and panel time, um, that's great. Um, you can also interrupt me while I'm up here as well. It's totally fine. Uh, but if you do ask questions later in the Q&A panel, you have the opportunity to win some prizes. So, uh, you know, there's some incentive for you for sure. So some ground rules up front I'd like to set. Um, here be opinions. Obviously, uh, I've tried to be as objective as possible in this process, but since I am giving you advice, the nature of this talk is a little bit subjective, right? Um, so take it all with a grain of salt. Um, also, um, it's not exhaustive, right? Uh, I can't possibly begin to cover everything on this topic. In fact, you've probably been in other sessions like this, and we could make whole courses and books out of this. In fact, Don has a book about this that I'll talk about later. Um, but you know, if you do enjoy the career sessions, um, definitely leave that feedback in the survey afterwards. I'll put the link up front as well, uh, or at the end there. Uh, additionally, uh, I am not a motivational speaker. Uh, don't believe anything that my colleagues tell you. Uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you to rise and grind and hustle harder. Um, that's not my style. You know, that may work for some folks, but that's not me. I'm not Tony Robbins up here. Uh, also, uh, this is not a branding talk. Uh, Harjeet, my Dollywall, my colleague, did a great uh, coverage of that yesterday, so I'm not really going to focus on that part of the conversation. If it is something that you want more advice on, we do have the Q&A and panel after this, so this is a hybrid talk. We'll have both sections, so if you want more of those questions, you know, we can talk about it as a panel together uh, afterwards. Uh, and lastly, of course, audience participation is encouraged, right? I'm going to ask you for a show of hands at some point, nothing serious. Um, so feel free to, to raise your hands if you can. And if you want to interrupt me in a timely manner, if it's something you feel like is something we need to cover right now, feel free to raise your hand. I'll, uh, we'll talk about it then. Um, but you know, otherwise, if you want to save it till the end, we do have that panel in the Q&A as well. Sound good so far? Everybody on the same page? Cool. Haven't actually covered any content, so not a bad, not a bad sign. OK, so um, let's start with introductions and career journey a little bit here. Let me introduce myself. Who's this Adil guy standing in front of you, right? Um, I am Adil Ligari. I am a, currently a senior solutions engineer at Okta. Uh, I've spent about two decades in technology. I know I may not look that old, but believe me, my body assures me daily that I am that old. Uh, and uh, 15 of those years I've spent as a sysadmin, so sort of in the operational side of things, in the trenches a little bit, working on tech um, and, and sort of honing those PowerShell skills early. Um, and uh, I'm obviously passionate about PowerShell, DevOps, and automation, 
and platform engineering or whatever the kids are calling it these days. Uh, I've been a speaker and author in this space for a while and I'm a, I'm a big advocate of PowerShell and automation. Um, also, randomly, uh, PowerShell sticker artist. So I used to uh, make a lot of logos for open source uh, projects and organizations as well as random PowerShell memes. You'll see some of them up here. I have some of these in my bag, so feel free to you know, find me in the hallway track later. I'm happy to pass on some stickers too. Um, so let's talk about my journey into PowerShell, right? Uh, wind back to 2017, um, I was working for the university um, for over a decade at this point and uh, in the public sector. And my manager approached me at the time and said, hey, Adil, you know PowerShell, right? Uh, and in my head, I was like, oh, well, I kind of know how to Google and copy and paste from Stack Overflow, but uh, my outside voice said, sure, yeah, how can I help? Uh, and I kind of started looking into it a bit. Our colleague had moved on to another role uh, on the team uh, and uh, left basically a folder full of miscellaneous PowerShell scripts uh, that performed a lot of operational tasks that we still use today. Um, so we didn't really have a deep understanding or any organization around these scripts, um, so I kind of wanted to start building some modules and organize the code a little bit better, right? Um, so I quickly found that Google and Stack Overflow were not the best approach and it could only get me so far. So uh, I ended up in the PowerShell community Slack um, around 2017, 2018. And that was the time that I, I really started hanging out with those folks. And uh, you know, um, I started asking questions there in PowerShell help and in, uh, in Bridge specifically uh, was the channel that bridges between Slack, Discord, IRC. Uh, and I really found that the folks in that group were so welcoming and generous with their time. And you know, they took this teach a person to fish approach uh, when sort of giving me guidance, which really like, which, which attracted me, which I was really fond of, because it wasn't just they're gonna answer the question for me, they sort of helped me get there myself. Um, and you know, I, I really can't emphasize this enough. Um, this is so rare in online technical forums. Um, you know, the community, the forums at PowerShell.org, the PowerShell community Slack, these folks, uh, you know, uh, are so welcoming and, and it was so rare in a lot of technical forums because I, I don't know if you'd ask questions before in Stack Overflow or other places, there can be sort of toxic communities and a lot of, a lot of like, you know, RTFM out there. So I really enjoyed these, these folks and it kind of blew me away. And um, not only did I get those answers that I wanted, but, you know, um, I also made me want to kind of hang around in, that, in those channels. So I ended up in Bridge a lot in PowerShell help. Um, hanging out with Thomas Rayner and other folks here. So um, that really like boosted my career because not only did I start learning um, some of this stuff and asking the right questions, but over time, you know, I started like actually being able to answer those questions. And I got to the point where I could start answering questions for new folks that came into the forum uh, or, or in the Slack. And uh, I really love that feeling. And it really like kind of dro drove me in my career in that way. And it was around that time, January 2019, I posted this tweet, I've pinned it, it's been pinned since then on my Twitter, and it says, you know, if you've ever felt intimidated by the online tech community, uh, number one, don't be. And uh, number two, come check out the PowerShell community on Slack, Discord, and IRC, and the other places there. They're bar none the loveliest, most welcoming, and helpful folks I've come across in my years in tech. So um, if you'll indulge me just to shout out a few folks, um, you know, Rain, Stephen Valdinger, Corey Knox, Chris Gardner, Brett Miller, Mikey Lombardi, and Thomas Rayner, who's sitting in the front row here, will be on the panel later. These people be became kind of like my own little personal brain trust, if you will, you know, of like mutual mentorship folks that, that helped us. We helped each other sort of in our PowerShell career. So that was very unique. Insert Lee Daly grin right there, just as an Easter egg. Um, anyway, so cut to 2019, April. Um, so with a lot of encouragement from my friends in the PowerShell community, and a healthy dose of imposter syndrome, I attended my first, I decided to attend my first PowerShell Summit in 2019. Um, now, I got a great amount of value from this, obviously. Um, it felt like a real crash course in all levels of PowerShell experience, and, and I actually paid for it out of pocket. But that's kind of a story for another slide. Um, but one of the things that stood out was sort of the hallway track and sort of talking to folks informally outside the talk. So hallway track was one of those things like where I really Felt like you know I, I built relationships here in person you know that, that are irreplaceable, and um, I've made lifelong friends seriously along the way. Um, and and at that same PowerShell Summit in 2019, uh, I was fortunate to meet um, uh, Rob Reynolds, the CEO and founder of Chocolatey Software. And Rob actually um, 
was amazing. He took time to talk to me and sort of mentor me a bit. And he saw some qualities in me uh, you know, that I even didn't see myself yet. Um, and that was really important. So soon afterwards, Rob reached out and he offered me a job as a solution engineer um, at Chocolatey Software. Um, I think it was pre-sales engineer at the time. I don't remember the title, but it was, it was a cool opportunity. I talked it over with my friends and I thought I'd go for it. But I definitely am indebted to Rob and my Chocolatey family uh, who all, you know, my colleagues there, they believed in me, they trusted in me, and they invested in me and, and got me sort of where I am today, um, which is, you know, after a couple of jobs now, I'm a senior solutions engineer at Okta. So my purpose for telling you this is not just because I love talking to myself, so don't listen to folks, um, but also because um, I just want to show you my story and show you what's possible from here, from this very conference, right? Uh, that was really my start into PowerShell and sort of furthering my career. So I, I really want to give you an example that this is possible. And um, I know at least 10 of my close friends, and I'm sure a lot of us have these stories um, where we've either made or seriously up-leveled our career just from being here. Okay, so let's get, let's get to brass tacks. How do you know when and how to start making this change or the next step in your career, right? Uh, so shameless uh, plug, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a second actually. Let's cover this piece first. Um, this is gonna sound a little bit confusing and it's a loaded statement, I'll warn you ahead of time. Firstly, it's obviously your decision also never, also always. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So at the end of the day, it's always your call. You kind of have to have that motivation within yourself and um, you know, no one can tell you when it's time to start looking for your next role but you. So it's, it's of your own volition, you gotta be proactive in that. Um, and the never part of the statement refers to the fact that it's never gonna be a perfect time. You're never, if you're waiting for that perfect time to start looking, uh, you know, you've already waited too long because you'll, you'll, never, you'll never get to that perfect time, so that's not a good approach to this. Uh, and always is always like, you know, it, it always is a good time. And I, I'm not telling you to go out and quit your job here and put a, like an open to work banner on LinkedIn. Um, that's sort of not what I'm implying. What I'm saying is it's always be open to have that conversation. Even if it's sort of a pesky recruiter on LinkedIn, you know, that you've heard from and, and the, the job role doesn't match what you wanna do, be open to have the conversation. Just have a conversation with those folks. It may turn out to be a really good opportunity. So, so it is sort of always a good time. You're doing yourself a disservice if you don't follow that path. So all of that said, here are some signs that you can look out for um, that it may be a good time to start looking, just generally. Um, so the first one is, obviously you're feeling unfulfilled or unchallenged in your current role. Um, so uh, if you've kind of reached your comfort zone um, and there's really not much that's coming across your desk or tickets that are coming to you um, that you feel are challenging or pushing you to grow, um, then that's generally a good sign that you start a need, need to start sort of start looking or being open to opportunities. Um, and if there are no opportunities for growth uh, in this uh, current organization, if you've kind of hit the ceiling, there's nothing more you can go to. Uh, you know, um, you've kind of done all there is to do. You're the Jeff Hicks of the world, and you know, you may want to start looking at other other spots um, or other other more challenging roles or different disciplines even. Um, so that's that's definitely a, a big sign. Um, another one, the big one, an important one to cover today is is burnout. So um, I know there's a lot of like. Uh, you know, post-pandemic burnout, there's, there's a lot of like non-separation of work from home now. Um, so you may be feeling a little bit like you're constantly overwhelmed or stressed or uh, exhausted in your job. Um, there's, this also kind of like belies other things underneath the surface, underneath the surface. So I would say, I would encourage you to reach out to your management if you can have that conversation because there may be like deeper staffing or resourcing issues in your current role and your current team. Um, it's a tough conversation to have, but my personal recommendation is if you bring some data, uh, you know, a lot of uh, reporting tools are built into help desk and other things um, where you can collect some data basically to have some metrics to show your manager or your management. That goes a lot further in making your argument for a staff or resourcing issue than just you showing up and saying I'm overwhelmed, right? So that's my personal advice. Um, you may find um, that with management sometimes like they will either dismiss the issue or tell you they'll do something about it and six months or a year goes by and suddenly you're feeling like, hey, nothing's changed. So, so that's definitely also a sign that you still need to keep your options open. And if you've you know, been open to having discussions with folks, you may have some options there already that you can pursue. So definitely worth doing. And this last one, this last point is a little bit of a nuanced one. I put it in there um, just to kind of give you another perspective. 
Um, so you uh, may have a misalignment of mission or values between yourself and your employer. So yeah, this can be a little bit tricky, but um, let's give you an example. So if your employer has decided to uh, pivot the entire organization and go all in on, let's say, crypto, Web3, blockchain, and NFTs, uh, um, which they have every right to do, um, but you may personally think that, let's say, NFTs are a bit of a grift and you don't really want to support that whole uh, scene, so that can be a tough spot for you as, as an employee, right? You may not buy into that, and that's going to drive your um, real um, ability to work for that organization or ability to commit fully to their mission, right? Um, so for me personally, that would be something where I would want to start looking. We good so far? Everybody good? Any questions? We, can, we, we have the panel after two as well. So um, I'm putting in a shameless plug here uh, for Don's book. Um, so anybody aware of the, the Own Your Tech Career by Don Jones? Has anybody, anybody have a copy of this book already? Awesome. Well, well the good news is, you know, at the Q&A and part of this uh, evening on the panel, if you do, um, you know, ask a good question, you have the possibility of winning a copy as well. I'll be giving out an e-version of this as well. So, so yeah, another encouragement to ask some good questions. It's a great book. I do recommend it. I am not going to make a replacement for this book here. I, I definitely go, uh, suggest you go out and read it, but I'm going to distill some points from it right here on this slide. And one of the big points that Don has made many times um, on the, uh, in different podcasts and keynotes is, you know, your job belongs to your employer, but your career belongs to you. Now, what do I mean by that, right? Um, I mean, your employer is responsible for your job, um, for hiring you, for having a contract, for making sure you deliver on your task and paying you. All of these parts of your job are your employer's responsibility. But your career, you're sort of driving that forward, um, that responsibility lies squarely on your own shoulders. Um, so you have to map out your own career goals uh, and the systems to support that. Um, and also, you need to take those steps to make those goals happen. So you also, along those lines, have to decide what you want to invest in and, and when to invest to, f to further your own career. That's really up to you. So here's a small example of that. So I mentioned earlier I went to PowerShell Summit in 2019. Uh, I worked for a public sector university. Uh, they were not going to spend taxpayer dollars on sending me to PowerShell Summit, um, and rightly so. Uh, in some ways, so uh, I decided at, in 2019 that that was an investment that I wanted to make in myself and in my career. So I paid for that out of pocket, the two grand or whatever it was, uh, and it was a, I thought it was a worthy investment to make in myself to reach out and network with folks in the PowerShell community, and you know, obviously it worked out. So um, there, there you go. That's an example of sort of my career belonging to me and sort of me making the investment to push it forward. Um, now another concept that I'll borrow from Don, but I've kind of paraphrased and reworded is um, your career trajectory, right? You need to set that sort of North Star goal of what's the next role or the, what's the next two or three roles even that I'm aiming for. So um, this is sort of borrowing from Don, but kind of changing it a little bit. Um, so an important part of this process is, uh, you know, this is an exercise you can do later, but I encourage you to write this down. Um, it's, it's, it's take a pen and paper, a pencil and paper, and write this down. It's sort of a, a visceral act of doing that. You can kind of write it, something down, think about it, and then scratch it out, do some additional research, and, and figure out what are those big ticket career goals or roles that you want to hit um, in your future. And so this is sort of more in the, in the realm of your dream job. Like we can talk about how much money you want to make, how you want to have a good work-life balance, take all these vacations. That's all great. But for the purpose of this exercise, we're focusing on jobs and roles. Um, and so this can be sort of your dream job or your dream job you know, three, five years down the line. But what I encourage you to do is also um, sort of do your research and plan out like the stepping stone roles that you may have to first get to to get to that end job. So, you know, what's the next role in that career as well? I need you to sort of operationally define that. That's going to take a little bit of research on your part, but I guarantee it's worth the investment. It's worth taking that time. You may have to look on LinkedIn a bit and get some ideas. Um, one of the ways to do this is to DM colleagues, some private message, some colleagues who already who you already know are in this position or you know, you're a PowerShell summit. This is a great point to talk to folks who are also in similar roles that you want to be in, and you know, pick their brain a little bit about you know what's what are what are goals that I need to meet to get there. What are what are some technologies that I need to be familiar with in order to get that role? Right, um, that can be a great way to do it. And just talk to people, folks here, or you know, PM folks in that in that um, in that field. Uh, and another little bit of a hack is 
if you want to go on LinkedIn and look for that position at different organizations, that's going to give you um, sort of a job description. And that job description is sort of going to be bullet points of exactly the type of things you need to figure out um, and you need to be able to perform those, those types of tasks or that level of experience. Um, so it gives you a way to sort of operationally define the steps you need to take or the goals that you need to hit um, to get to that next role. So it's a worthy exercise. Do this if you can have time um, later. Um, and I'm kind of going to transition into my second thing. I promise this is not a book review um, you know, entirely. This is just two books that I'll recommend. This is the last book. Uh, how many of you have read or have a copy of Atomic Habits sitting on your shelf that you haven't cracked open for a year? Yeah, yeah, that's me too. So I, I, I did reread this for the, for the talk. Um, I, it's a great book. It's a great way to sort of build around this. And um, James Clear has a great idea of Atomic Habits of taking these large goals, these nebulous goals, um, uh, and um, breaking them down into individual habits that you can perform every day. And those habits can sort of become a system that supports you that are a lot more achievable um, and, and sort of you know, palatable, sort of you know, chunking that into bite-sized bits. So you can take those goals of that role you have uh, and break it down into, into manageable bits. And we'll go through an exercise to do this here. So I'm just going to take the example of myself. I am a senior solutions engineer right now. Uh, my next step in my career journey is principal solution engineer or principal solution architect. So along those lines, a couple of certifications that I can explore at Okta are the Okta Certified Consultant, Developer Architect. Those are steps in my role that I can take, goal, individual goals that I can meet. Um, it also, like often in this job description, when I looked at it or talked to colleagues, it said three to five years of identity and access management experience. Right? You're going to come across this a lot in job descriptions roles. What that really means is you know, um, that's that much experience with that specific technology field. So that can feel a little bit like, OK, how do I operationally define that and break that down into roles? Well, well, for this example, right, um, what I, the way I approach it is technology. So what are the underlying protocols and formats and technologies that are related to the role? So in, the, in my case, that's SAML 2.0, OAuth 2, OIDC, authentication authorization flows. That's that specialty. So when I talk about three to five years experience, when I talk to my colleagues in that role, those are the technologies that I need to be familiar with and protocols. So each of those individual technologies have courses available. Right? There's, there's material out there. There's books to cover. So that's how I break that individual um, you know, uh, concept down of three to five years of experience. These are the individual technologies that I should have been familiar with in this level of experience. So then I can start when I break that down to think about those individual things, goals that I'm going to hit there. And obviously, lastly, you know, always diversify. Don't put your, all your eggs in one basket. So um, as a solution architect, um, you know, there's solution architect certifications in Azure and AWS. And I would... Um, you know, sort of serve myself well if I was also diversifying and keeping myself abreast of where the technology is headed. Don't try not to marry yourself to just one stack, right? Always keep your options open there. So let's take the Azure Certified Solution Architecture um, uh, certification as an example here um, and use Atomic Habits a little bit for a system. So I have this certification, um, right, that I want to meet. I'm breaking this down, let's say, into three month chunks. Um, so those three months, then I have, from those three months, I have 12 weeks. The math may not add up here, but just follow along for the example. So like for these 12 weeks that I have, let's say there's 10 units of either a video course that I'm working through or uh, an online course or even like a book that I'm working through. So those 10 units, I could very much assign to 10 different weeks there. And then the last two weeks I could spend on, you know, practice exams and review uh, in preparation for the exam. So from that now, from those 12 weeks, I have seven days per week um, for those three months. So now I'm breaking that down further and going, okay, how much do I need to cover? So either that's 15 minutes of video coursework or 15 pages or whatever it is. It's that small chunk of time that you need to do daily. So if you create this plan early on and you build this habit, right, now I've got something that's digestible. Now everybody can manage 15 minutes a day. Believe me, I have a seven-month-old baby at home and I can do it, so no excuses. Um, definitely, um, definitely break that down because then those 15 minutes, you know, that actually gives you a lot of momentum. It's going to be a knock-on effect. Once you start doing the 15 minutes every day, you're going to see yourself want to do 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And, you know, you'll achieve a lot in this process of breaking this down than you would if you just had that big nebulous goal up there. So this is what James Clear talks about with building habits and building a system. 
you know, get everything out of the way. You know, have a portion of your desk where the book is and maybe turn off the laptop. If it's a laptop, then only have that application open and focus for those 15 minutes. You know, have a game plan, have it in your calendar for that day that this is what I'm gonna do and what I'm gonna cover. And once you, you know, once you build that system, you'll kind of get addicted to it. And it'll, it'll just become an automatic habit of yours that, no, nope, this is the time I'm dedicating to this. Showing up in my calendar, my colleagues aren't bugging me at that time. I've discussed it with my manager. Even do it during your work day if, you're, if your manager's open to supporting that. Um, so two quick quotes that I'll pull out of James Clare's book. These always stay with me, so they're worth mentioning. Um, you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. So if I wanted to be an Azure Certified Solution Architect, I could write that on a Post-it stick it on my monitor and look at it every day. Uh, it looked great, but I'd never get there, right? I, I really don't have achievable steps to get to that point. But when I have a habit that I've developed, when I have that system every day, I, that's gonna automatically kick in. And I'm gonna be able to hit that system a lot more regularly than I will from that nebulous goal there. That post is gonna help me, serve me a lot less than the actual system that I've built every day. And the other uh, important one here, and this is, a bit deeper, but um, every action you take is a vote for the person you wish to become. Now, all of us have this inner monologue, this narrative, this imposter syndrome that creeps in that said, I'm not that guy or gal. Like, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I can't do the Azure, I don't have time for that, you know? I'm not gonna wake up at 6 a.m. to work out, that's not me, right? Easy to say, um, and it becomes a part of your identity. You tell yourself that enough, and it becomes automatic. You can be very dismissive of any new thing, but the important point is that system that you built, that habit, every single day you complete that, that is a vote for that new identity that you want to embody. It's sort of like a, a cognitive reframing that you go through in your head where you suddenly start becoming that person. Well, yeah, actually I am that guy. I'm gonna crush it every day and I'm gonna hit those 15 minutes and I'm gonna, I'm gonna nail that CISSP certification, right, Thomas? Uh, Thomas actually has a great one. I'll let him talk about it in the panel. But um, when he did his CISSP, he actually blogged about it. Uh, and I love this example because not only are you engaging with people out in the community, but you know, you're sharing that knowledge, but also you're keeping yourself honest. You're constantly uh, submitting new posts to that every day. I, I love this example. I don't like to use it too much because honestly, I haven't updated my blog in a long time, so I'm guilty of that, but I'll let Tom put that. Yeah, there you go, right? So that, that, that can fall by the wayside if you, so be, be conscious not to add too many um, uh, steps to your procedure or your system that you have because sometimes you'll be like, oh yeah, and I could do this and I could do this, but then you end up not doing any of it. So try and keep it simple as possible. Um, it will, it'll really serve you well. Okay, so now let's talk about career objections, right? In this process, you're gonna have that, you know, um, voice creep in, the imposter syndrome, the other, other um, normal objections that you get in your head. So let's talk about them, let's be open about them, and let's try and tackle some of them and find solutions, right? Um, they're out there, and so we, we need to address them. So firstly, it's, uh, this is a big one, networking is schmoozy, right? It's weird or it's gross. I, I, it feels a little fake to me. Um, valid, valid concern. Uh, recruiters are annoying. Yes, yes, they are. They can be. If anybody spent any time on LinkedIn, you've come across this before. Um, the job title or the job description is unrealistic, right? Or doesn't align with what, where you see yourself going in your career. That can, that can happen. Um, this is my favorite one. I'm happy where I am, right? I'm content. I don't need to move. I'm good. I'm comfortable. We, we can address it. I, I, I'm very happy for you if you are. Um, and the job is not PowerShell related, let's say. That's another one uh, we can touch on. So let's start at the beginning. Networking is weird or gross or schmoozy. So <laughs> this one is like a common one. Um, I, I liken this to sort of um, you know, a misattribution or like a poor definition of what networking is. Right, we're at this conference, we're constantly like in hallway track talking to people and networking. So I come, I approach it with um, the concept of authenticity. You are who you are, be yourself. You don't need to change that. You don't need, to be, we're all a little bit awkward too, right? It's fine, we're all awkward. If you feel awkward, we're all here, we're all awkward. I'm awkward here, up here standing here in front of you. So it's not so much about the selling yourself part of things, right? People attribute this to selling yourself. I don't look at it that way, I prefer to take sort of the John Janelle approach to this, so building relationships, right? It's really about connecting with people, you know, having honest conversations with them, being genuinely interested in them, and, and engaging them and, and understanding where they're coming from, right? It's, that's that relationship that you build that goes a lot further than, hey, you know, this is why you should hire me, give me a job sort of thing. That's not the approach you should take, in my opinion, right? 
uh, for this. Come from a place of authenticity. Second point uh, is an easy one, find your tribe, right? Find the people that are working on the technology or have the habits or whatever that you, or hobbies that you uh, believe in or that you identify with. It's an easy one for me here. This is my tribe right here, PowerShell folks. The community has been a huge part of my career, so I hang out with these folks online all the time, all throughout the year. Um, it's easy to do, but even if you have a hobby, you know, that's not tech related, you're gonna be able, if you wanna go to a networking event around that hobby, you're gonna be able to connect with those folks a lot better than, um, you know, folks that have nothing to do with you. I, I kind of personally, this is just my opinion, but um, I find general networking events to be a little bit of not, not a productive use of my time because you're really meeting folks from different backgrounds and stuff and it's kind of like turns into the sell yourself approach that I, which I don't like anyway. Um, so it's important to sort of identify and have that conversation with yourself and find the tribe of people that you, you work well with. Uh, and do your homework, right? If you're going to an event and you know a few folks are gonna be there that you actually do wanna talk to, go look at their LinkedIn ahead of time. You know, Look at their um, career trajectory where it's gone, look at the roles that they've had, look at the school that they went to or other interests they have. Um, kind of like, you know, have, do your homework when you go out and have a conversation with them. You, there are ways in which you can work this naturally into a conversation where it makes the person feel impressed that, that you actually cared enough to, to, uh, to look, up, look them up a little bit. And it's important. Now, I will, for the love of all things PowerShell, please do not go up to people and list out their LinkedIn um, uh, roles and positions. Uh, this has happened to me before. It's a weird experience. It doesn't need to be creepy. <laughs> so you kind of can approach it in a way where like, you know, you authentically work this into a conversation. Just have that in the back of your head. It can be something you connect with and connect with them on. Um, and so pr active, practice act, this is, this is a big one for me, folks. I talk a lot, and so I do need to work on listening too. Um, be actively listening, practice active listening, and ask questions. Ask questions is the biggest hack for this, I find. Um, it's a great way to approach something where it's like, I want to be engaged in that person, and, and I want them to feel like I'm engaged in what they're saying, so I ask questions. But asking questions is just a part of this. I could have a list of questions in my head and rattle them through one after the other, and the person gets really turned off. The reason is because I haven't really been using, like I ask one question, and then my next question should be informed by the answer that I'm given. I need to show the person that I've understood what they said or I've taken that advice to heart. Um, so don't just rattle off questions. Actually, inf have your earlier questions inform your later questions. And that will, in a, natural, in a conversation, that's going to show the person that you're more engaged in them and, and, and you care, um, right? And, and the last point I'll make here is to help others, right? It's simple, folks, but you're not necessarily here to get your next job. You're here to build a community, right? And um, a lot of that is about, you know, um, not necessarily what you're gonna get out of it, but if you can connect one person here to their next role, if you know the person in an organization, you know, you're gonna get a huge amount of satisfaction out of helping somebody else out, and you're gonna build a friend for life there. They're gonna look out for you in your next role. So the karma comes back to you one way or the other, folks. So that's a really important point here. You know, help those around you, and it will, it will pay you dividends in the long run. Okay, next objection, recruiters are annoying. It's a tough one to tackle. Um, so I will say, first of all, not all recruiters are created equal. The folks that land in your inbox and LinkedIn and say, hey, this is a great role for you. It's non-remote friendly, available in India, and for half the money you're making right now, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about here, right? I mean, that's gonna happen too. Um, but um, there are recruiters out there who are more focused in certain technical areas. Uh, there are recruiters um, that are experts at their job, that are good at what they do, they specialize in it, and they, you know, they're the ones who are posting podcasts and regularly posting on LinkedIn and other things like that. They're active in their community. So find these folks. It may require a little bit of research to do that. Now, I know there are great resources here. We've all known like one or two maybe recruiters that we used in our process. Um, an example I'll give in the Research Triangle PowerShell user group, um, Mike Knackos and Phil Bossman know one recruiter who's presented, and she's presented multiple times, and she's actually managed to get a few folks PowerShell-related roles in their discipline. So, you know, it's worth, it's worth exploring that and sort of getting this cachet of, you know, uh, internal recommendations for really good recruiters, right? So now you've found the good recruiters, the next step is to diversify. So let's say you've got three different recommendations of quality recruiters, you know? Uh, you know, make them all work out there. Like, you know, don't put your, all, all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you may think, okay, uh, this is the best recruiter that I've found. I'm just gonna kind of stick with them. No, for sure no. You definitely want to explore, let's say, all three of those options because 
worst case scenario, none of them but one is going to work out and you'll get that one recommendation for a job or interview loop. Um, but best case scenario, you know, you get three or four different opportunities out of that and now you have the luxury of choice. It, the choice is yours now and you can decide what you want to take as your next step. Um, the other piece of this is pro be proactive. This has happened to me before where, you know, a recruiter sounded really interested and then they went quiet. They ghosted you, right? Um, recruiters, we're all human beings, right? We can practice a little bit of grace here. Um, we all get busy, right? Um, this recruiter may have had a life event or something else that came up that you, they can't help. Um, I've, I've had it before where I reached out to them and the recruiter had said, I will follow up with you in a week. Obviously they didn't, um, so then a week and a bit goes by and I, I actually did the job of like emailing them back and following up with them myself and they actually really appreciated it because they were going through something at the time and they worked hard for me and actually secured a position in this company. So had I not done that, you know, I would have missed that opportunity and that's, that's, that's not a regret you want to have. The last piece of this is be patient, right? Um, let's say that 5% of recruitment uh, works out or leads to an opportunity. Um, that's one in 20 chances there. Right? So you have to put the 20 chances of work in there and be patient. Um, that's going to take a while and it's going to be disheartening and you'll feel a little bit of rejection, but you know, that patience and perseverance is going to pay off. You want that next big role. If you don't put the work in, you know, you're not going to get there. So it's worth it, believe me. Next objection, uh, the job title or the job description is unrealistic or doesn't align with what you want. Well, yeah, the reality is that most titles and job descriptions can be misleading uh, and may be inaccurate. I know my, I'll tell you, my, my partner is a director in HR in a senior tech company. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of these folks, these managers are very busy. You know, they don't have time to, um, you know, curate these roles and job descriptions, they're probably using a boilerplate or a template. So, so they're not necessarily investing that much time in that job description. Now, that doesn't mean that couldn't be your perfect role. So, a couple of recommendations here. They may not work, but they're just an idea. Um, you can reach out to that recruiter, and Don actually has this idea in his book, or he's mentioned on podcasts before. You know, um, ask them for a couple of paragraphs. Say, hey, this role doesn't kind of align based on what you may have seen in my LinkedIn profile and sort of my career of where I'm going. Can you maybe just give me two paragraphs worth of an explanation of what it entails? And if they're a great recruiter, they're going to be able to come back to you or have a conversation with you about it and see if it actually still does align with your roles, because it, it's a very good chance it could. You never know. Um, an additional thing is if you have a LinkedIn connection or somebody else you know at that organization, you could reach out to them for clarification. You can say, hey, this is my next role. This is my next step that I've defined. Um, this is the jobs that's up. Um, it doesn't quite align. What's the flexibility here? Do we have an option? Like, can, can we still pursue this? Can I kind of still get to these career goals? Or, or can you show me how if this could possibly be a good fit? Um, and um, you know, likely what they'll tell you is the next point here, which is, I'll bring this up a few times, apply anyway, right? It's okay, even if you don't feel you have the experience, even if it doesn't align. You know, what your, your goal is in this process is to get past that HR step, to get past and into the interview loop. At that point, you can make the decision whether both ways, to, with the employer and yourself, whether it's, it's not a good fit. It's totally okay for it to not be a good fit, but the, the point is you really need to get to that step. And sometimes, you know, in this process, we don't even know, we're not sure. Like, when I, when I, was exploring the idea of working at an identity company. You know, identity and access management, surprise, surprise, wasn't the first thing that I wanted to do or specialize in in my career. I didn't know enough about it and I didn't feel like an expert in it. But I was lucky to be joining an organization which invests in their people and spends about three months uh, in an on-ramp program where you just learn and you don't face customers, you don't do any tasks or do anything like that. So they were able to invest in me in that process and, you know, I learned a new technology and grew in my career. So. Apply anyway, it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, big one here, I'm happy where I am, right? Um, if you are happy where you are, then sincerely, I'm happy for you. Um, but you potentially haven't been listening to what I'm saying, but that's okay, I'll explain that again. Um, I would encourage you to keep an open mind here, right? Uh, in the last decade I've been in tech, um, I've, every single opportunity I've got, I wasn't necessarily looking at that time. I was comfortable where I was, I didn't really need to, to, um, to pursue anything else. I didn't think I needed to anyway, but I kept that open mind and I said, you know what, I'm always open to having the conversation. So I had the discussion with folks and turns out, you know, some of these jobs were right up my alley and, and ended up progressing my career. So I'd encourage you to keep that open mind. Um, another point I'll make here is content equals comfortable, right? Um, if you don't feel any discomfort or 
you know, um, being pushed or, um, in, your, in your current position, that feeling, um, then you're likely content and you're sort of comfortable. And I, I equate that to um, not really growing. You know what I mean? Like you, you need to push yourself into that place of discomfort because that's where you get to grow the most. Um, that's how I feel anyway. So, and also, of course, there may be opportunities with your organ own organization, right? If you have this sort of relationship with your manager, uh, I'd encourage you to tell them the, about your next role that you want to get or the next career step if it's available in the org. And that manager, you'd be surprised, they'll actively work to help you get to that position within the organization. People always want to promote from within. So, you know, if you have that relationship or you can build that relationship with your manager, I'd encourage you to explore that internally. And I've even known, or I have friends who have managers who've actively helped them get roles in different companies just because they were so invested in their career. And you'd be surprised how much folks can help if you're honest and you're you know, authentic about what you want to do and pursuing your goals. Um, there's no shame in that. Um, the last point I'll make here is money. This is uh, sort of a necessary evil, but we have to bring it up um, sort of for folks who are comfortable where they are. I'll just throw up a slide here and, and refer to a study from Pew Research done last year. Um, so in that analysis, about half of the workers who change jobs saw their pay increase nearly 10%. That is control for inflation. Uh, and the median worker who stayed put, importantly here, um, saw an inflation-adjusted loss of 2%. Um, so just by doing nothing, by being complacent there, you may be actually losing money in that process if you control for inflation there. We all know how crazy inflation's gotten lately, so I'll just put that there and leave that there and let it uh, you know, marinate with you for a bit. Um, and here's a big one. Job is not PowerShell related, right? Surprise, surprise. I know it sounds scary, but you will grow beyond PowerShell sometimes in your career, and that's okay. You know, you will sprout wings and leave this nest little bird, and that's a good thing, you know, at the end of the day. The, again, I come back to that mantra I've had most of my life, that discomfort equals growth, right? If you, if you don't know Power, uh, Python, if you don't know Go or Ruby or something else, um, you know, it's okay. That you'll get there and, and you know, um, have confidence in the fact that you've learned the chops, you've honed your skills here in PowerShell, and those translate into other languages and other other, other roles in the future. Um, apply anyway, like I said before, um, and, and be open to scaling up in that process. Um, so what you can do is with, uh, often with employers is you can tell them, hey, I'm not ready for this position, or I don't, you, my, my role or my skills don't line up with this current job posting, but hey, are you open for me to be on a probationary period for three months where I skill up and I understand and I learn? And you know, if you um, even wanna get that on paper, you know, you wanna write it down, you say, okay, 70% of my salary I'll take now, and then if I hit the, my goals in three, three months, you know, possibly get me a probation period, and then we go, agree to 100% salary. I, it's worked for some folks. I will say, get it in paper if you're gonna, if you're gonna follow that, because you, know, you may not get the last 30% ever, but like, definitely something worth exploring if that's not the career that you currently have, or, or, or the role, or the skills that you currently have. And again, you can highlight those transferable skills, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the point I'll make here as well is, you know, a lot of folks in disciplines, like my colleagues in PowerShell, you know, um, they're not, um, after four or five years now, a lot of them are not writing a lot of PowerShell, right? My colleague, Glenn Sardi, basically exclusively writes Ruby most of his time. Uh, you know, Thomas, you're probably more C -sharp .net or TypeScript. Um, you know, um, Mike Lombardi, uh, you know, and Josh Duffney, both at Microsoft, probably spent a lot of time writing Go. You know, that's just, that's the reality, and that's okay. This is, because this can be the next step in your career, right? So let's highlight some of those transferable PowerShell skills real quick. And I'm conscious of time because we're at about the 43 minute mark here. Okay, so um, one of them is obviously problem solving, right? We've all had to troubleshoot and debug code, um, you know, step in and out of functions. Um, the whole point of that is, you know, that is a very transferable skill in any language format. So definitely good to highlight in terms of being able to troubleshoot, right, for like sort of SRE positions and stuff like that. Um, testing, if you've worked with Pester as a testing framework, you know, there are equivalents in every single language you know of, right? R spec in the case of Ruby and, and other testing frameworks, you know, it, the, it does, it is a translatable skill because being able to write the, the correct unit test or knowing the type of test to write is, is, really, um, is really useful for any language. Uh, communication and collaboration, this is a big one. Obviously, if you've ever worked in open source projects, and I highly recommend you do, um, you know, you're gonna be able to ha uh, deal with a team of people and work together, you know, to, to work through a PR and multiple commits, et cetera. But I find a real hack for this, um, if you're looking for one, is documentation. If you were an amazing documentarian, 
if I'm putting on my Mike Lombardi hat for a second, um, then that will serve you well in a lot of other roles and a lot of other positions in terms of communication and collaboration. That means you have empathy. You're able to step into the shoes of your fellow uh, developer and, and know exactly what they're gonna ask and help them along the way. And believe me, if you have great documentation, your colleagues are gonna love you and you'll build that trust um, with, with your network as well. Uh, and of course, lifetime learning, this is a big one. You know, we're all here, we're learning more about PowerShell, we're committed. Just the fact that you are here shows that you are committed to lifetime learning, and that's a skill that any employer wants. So these are all good things to mention if you are in that interview loop, that first, uh, that first step. Uh, you know, any employer is gonna really like the idea that you have these different sort of skills. I'll quickly mention a couple of PowerShell roles here. We're running late, well, long on time, so I wanna be respectful of your time. Okay. Um, so uh, one of them obviously is what I do, which is a solution engineer. You can sometimes be called a solution architect or a pre-sales engineer. So what I do is I talk to customers. Um, I'm customer facing, I know it's scary, sales, ah. But at the end of the day, like all I'm doing is I'm understanding the problems that different organizations have. I get to work with all different organizations every day uh, and I understand their problems and I find solutions to them. So I see if there's technology or features in our tool belt that we can use to help them. I, I find it a lot very exciting, I get to talk to new people every day, I love to talk, so obviously it helps me. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something to explore, happy to talk about it. I have slides on it, I'm not gonna cover it, we can talk about it in the panel if we want. Um, security analyst, uh, a great example, this is my colleague IIS Reset Me, Matthias Yesen, he's a security analyst, all started in PowerShell, uh, and uh, you know he's definitely a guy that I would ping, ping and talk to, or find in the hallway track if you can, he can give you more advice along that uh, uh, journey. Uh, pipeline, DevOps, automation engineer, so it's so like platform engineers, a lot of CI, CD, if you're working with GitHub Actions, you know, a lot of this stuff is very transferable and usable in many different languages and formats. Um, SRE, Sout Reliability Engineer, again, you have the ability to debug and troubleshoot and find efficiencies, um, you know, very popular role um, that people may not think about initially, and Cloud Architect. Um, so Cloud Architect is nebulous, right? It can mean anything. Um, and a lot of the times these jobs and roles don't mean a lot of things. So, but if you have the ability to have PowerShell, you have Azure PowerShell and you have AWS PowerShell in your tool belt, that's gonna help you interact with a lot of different clouds. Um, so helpful, helpful um, skill to have and, and applies to a lot of different roles there. Okay, so we're at about 47 minutes now. Um, so I'm gonna open this up to the panel discussion now. We can definitely talk about any of these individual topics if you want. Um, or uh, you know we, we can we can talk through the panel as well and, and see how we want to do this. What do you guys think? Are you ready for the panel? Cool, awesome, great. Any any questions by the way that we have before? I, you, because you know why, Mike? Because you were born ready, right? <laughs> okay, so I think we have um, uh, Thomas Rayner here, my colleague, and uh, Michael Bender uh, is Harjeet here. Harjeet Dollywall. No, okay, that's totally fine. Um, and John Janelle could be joining us later. So we'll start with this. Here, we'll start with the three of us. Uh, do you guys wanna maybe pull your chairs up and uh, we can try and do this in a fashion that's kind of good? Or do you guys wanna stay where you are? We can do that too. So I have with me the esteemed Michael Bender and uh, Thomas Rayner, uh, from, both from Microsoft, both ex MVPs. So a part of that MVP uh, track uh, on their way to beam up to the mothership. So um, if you guys could now, what I wanted to do for this panel is maybe just introduce yourselves and talk about um, you know, your unique individual PowerShell journey and what got you to where you are. And, and also if you can mention just a, a nugget or two of information that you wish you had when you were starting your career journey that could help folks or maybe even for folks starting off on OnRamp, would it be helpful? Go for it. Sounds great. My name is uh, Michael Bender. I am a senior content developer at uh, Microsoft and I work in the Azure networking area, so to kind of give you an idea of where I started, I graduated from college before email was a thing. And my first job in IT was converting Windows 95 machines to 98. Wow. I've done full-scale enterprise NT351 to 4.0 conversions. I've worked Exchange, everything up through the cloud. And then I spent 13 and a half years teaching at a community college. And that's where I learned 
everything, and that's kind of what led me to be here. But before that, I was a bartender, okay? And that's where my ability to work with people and understand people really came from. And so over the years, I've, I can say the most important thing is the people you know and the people you, you network with. I wouldn't be, I can specifically look at the last 15 to 20 years and I can pick out the exact conversations that led me to be here. I know those conversations and those people that I met that were most of the time completely random, they were a hallway talk that led me to get to where I am. So if you get anything out of this week, the most important thing is to meet others. And the biggest thing, and the thing that drives me and the thing that gets me up every day is my career, even though I was an MVP and you know all of that sort of stuff, and you know people walk up to me because I, I created this PowerShell Getting Started course on Pluralsight, and it was pretty popular, and I thought it was pretty good. It was um, good. That it's always been about sharing my knowledge with others. That what can I do to share what I know to help other people get up their ladder? That's what gets me up every day. That's what, you know, I like getting paid just as much as anybody else does. But what really excites me, and probably this came out of my life as a teacher, was seeing the success of others and knowing I was able to help somebody on their career journey. So if there's one last thing that I can say, share everything. I saw a talk by a guy from, named Ned Pyle. He did an internal talk a number of years ago, and he talked about the most important thing you can do is share everything because all of us know something about something we do that nobody else in this room does. So my, my blog's terrible because <laughs> I always thought that somebody else has already written this. Write it anyway. Write it for yourself. Write it for whoever because there's probably something in there that somebody else can use. And that sharing is gonna allow you to accelerate your career because that's what being a leader is, is you don't have to be a manager to be a leader. And those two things are not the same. There are a lot of managers out there that are terrible leaders, and there are a lot of great leaders that are terrible managers. It's very hard to find one that's a great manager and a great leader because they are two completely separate. So. A lot of points that I'm going to hit back on you, Mike. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> right on. Go ahead. Uh, first, uh, I'm Thomas Renner. I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft. Uh, I work on a team that provides security and privacy services to all the backend services that make Teams and Skype and a bunch of other messaging stuff run. Uh, and first and foremost, Adil has backed up the truck and dumped a ton of great knowledge. So this is all just supplemental. Um, I started writing code for money when I was 15 and kind of just kept doing it throughout college, got a degree in ops related stuff and took some jobs that were ops related stuff, but brought that sort of code writing and automation mentality to them, uh, which led me to online communities like uh, Adil mentioned the Slack for PowerShell, uh, the Discord as well. Uh, writing blog posts, speaking at user groups, and just the, it's a bit of an inertia game. The more you do, the more opportunities you find, and the more doors you tend to unlock for yourself. Uh, and so I became a Microsoft MVP, which opened up even more opportunities to speak and write blog posts and get early access to stuff. Uh, and it was through my blog uh, that one of my, um, my last team at Microsoft uh, coworkers found my blog. Oh, wow. He's blogging about a bunch of stuff that we do on our team and liked the way I explained some stuff and cold emailed me asking if I'd apply for a role. Uh, and that was how the mothership beamed me up. Uh, and since then, 
uh, that was where I specialized in security because that was a security team. Uh, but I was brought on board there, uh, not necessarily because of my security expertise, but because I was helping upskill the people on that team to do a better job of implementing development practices. And uh, that was a, a gap on that team that they needed help filling. Uh, and so in addition to the awesome uh, advice, uh, I would say most of the uh, most successful people in tech or really any industry are proactive and engaged relationship managers, which sounds kind of boring, but if you think about it, you have a relationship with your boss, with your coworkers, with the person at the breakfast table, with the people you bump into, with recruiters, even if it's a fleeting relationship or something really quick or whatever, or it's a lifelong relationship. Uh, people who are really successful and enjoy a lot of advancement don't just let these relationships happen to them, but they're engaged and deliberate about the type of relationship that they want to have. Um, and that's not to be manipulative or too calculated or like, oh, I need to say this to my boss so that they'll give me this. Like it's not transactional, but it's dwelling on, do I have a good relationship with my boss? Are they aware of what my goals are? Have I communicated that with them effectively? Uh, am I connecting with this person at the breakfast table authentically? And what are they actually about? Can we help each other? Um, is this a person I'd like to talk to later? Um, oh, they were really cool. I wish I'd got their email or Twitter or whatever. Oh, well, they're gone now. That active engagement is, uh, is really crucial. And to like uh, the point that Adil paraphrased from Don, um, you own your career. You also own all of your relationships. The only common element in all of your relationships is you. So to be active and engaged and really proactive about uh, the people that you connect with, the technologies will come and go, but the ability to connect with people and um, make them better and allow the help to make yourself better is really important. So that's good. I'm gonna keep the keep the mic there, Thomas, because this is a good one. I'm sorry, put you on the spot, but I do want to mention one of the things he brought up, which is you know um, that authentic connection with folks and you know helping each other. Um, uh, I don't know. This is funny, but I just had to mention this. The I, when I've been at networking events or in other spots like this, I tend to play a game with myself. I don't know if you guys do too, but I, I tend to not go to the obvious questions. I'll always be like, I'm not going to ask them what they do for a living. I just won't do it first because that's the easy place to go. Where'd you go to school? What'd you do for a living? Sort of actually build that relationship with them. Talk to them about them as a person and ask those uh, you know, questions and engage in active listening. It's kind of like um, when we started off in PowerShell or sort of like when I started pinging you a lot of times, like we didn't actually know what we were doing, either of us. We just connected because we're both uh, Canadian kids who were sort of trying to make it big, right? So that was that was a fun part of it. I, I really like that about, about it. But I don't know if you ever do this as well, but like approach things from, again, not that transactional nature, just trying to actually connect with people. Yeah, big time. Uh, and like the, hey, uh, who are you? What do you do for a living is a great icebreaker, especially if like it's weird to come up to somebody and go, hey, do you ever have a dog growing up? Like, <laughs> yeah. How'd you know? Like... Uh, but the, it, like, and so it's tough coming up with that stuff too, but the point you made in your session about um, letting their answer inform your next question is really crucial because that's that authentic thing. Because you might ask like, oh, what do you do? And they'll give you an answer that you either did or didn't expect, but your response to that, that authentic, I'm actually listening, I'm, I actually care, not just, oh, here's the next thing on my list. like. Where'd you go to school? Like, well, that had nothing to do. I said I didn't go to school. Whatever. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, like being being a human. <laughs> Anything to add to that, Mike? It's all good stuff. I will, I'm gonna, I might say something, an unpopular opinion here. Um, and as Thomas said, I've been on Microsoft twice. So I was at a role, and I joined actually right after, actually before, just because it, you were Canadian, so it took a lot longer. Um, okay. I was there before, and I was told a lot of ice. I knew I had a huge network of people that I knew at Microsoft, but my role didn't allow me to practice the networking I needed to be successful. Because one of the things that I found out at Microsoft is, I'll be kind of contrary to him, is that, and this is not a negative, it sounds negative, is that 
every relationship I have is transactional. And finding out and finding out some, that somebody's a human, that's a transaction for you. You want to do that, and they want to, there's that back and forth. I found that my second turn at Microsoft, I now I know how things work. And a friend of mine recently left Microsoft because they were part of it. I don't think they were, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard when you're in a really big company or any company in general to make those connections, especially I'm fully remote. And I was given the advice, I always have to be on campus every quarter and I try to do that. And it's very hard to do that now because we don't have any travel budget that for those of you that worked in the office or you, we all realize that when you're just working with somebody remote, you figure out how that works. Mm -hmm. But when you meet people in person, it, it changes that relationship. It's, you know, it's hard, it's, you know, kind of cliche to say, well, now I know that person is real, but there's just something about it, whether it's DNA, whether it's evolution, whether it's whatever, when you meet a person in person, it changes the relationship. It makes that relationship different. And I saw that through all of my relationships at Microsoft. Once I met these people in person, I was able to do it. Like Thomas, Thomas and I knew each other for ages through Slack or whatever. Our relationship went to the next level the first time we met, which was 2018, I believe, and you had just gotten the offer, and I was actually just going on campus to sit down with a general manager about a role, and all of that happened just kind of out of the blue by one of our friends, Rick, mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, that's. No, that's that's really good. I think it, it, no, you can hold on, that's fine. I have the love, so I'm good. Um, no, I think that that's important. I think, Mike, that stems from your sort of operational definition of what transactional means, you know, uh, as a relationship. I, I will say it is sort of a, a deeper bond, definitely meeting somebody in person. Uh, I know we can all account for the fact that we've known Corey Knox here for about six years online, and we saw him first in Meet Space, uh, you know, at this conference. So it's, I'm still getting used to it, to be honest. But it's I can't, all, feel, I can't believe he's that tall. Yeah, it's the first thing you think of. You're like, stand up, Corey. Stand up. Come on. Don't hit your head. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's so tall. He's like a big friendly giant. We love him. Uh, but yeah, no, it's definitely, um, I do find that, and, and, and sort of with colleagues, to, to mention your point, right? Um, Okta is about 6,000 folks multinationally, right? Um, and so they're spread across the globe. I, I always uh, paying or DM folks internally all the time. Uh, and what I try to do is obviously be respectful of their time zones. Uh, but it is sort of transactional in nature in that if I'm, to speaking to somebody senior and they have a project I, I need help on, um, like um, you know, having them come in and spend their time, I always try and be like, let me take that little bit of extra effort and ask them what they're doing. Maybe there's something that I can help them with too, right? Because at the end of the day, you're using somebody's valuable time. Firstly, you wanna ask a good question. If you have something you wanna prepare, <laughs> like there's, a, there's an article back in the day that online on the interweb somewhere called What Have You Tried? I don't know if you guys seen that before, but asking those good questions where it's like, if you have a problem, you come to somebody with, uh, you know, be, be ready to explain what you've already tried to figure it out. Uh, and that will sort of, and, and you know, that'll build some cachet or trust with that other person knowing this person's not gonna waste my time. So the next time when you ping them, they're gonna be way more helpful with you because they'll know you've already done a little bit of your homework there. And then if you can also like follow them online and in different places, and see what they're working on and possibly contribute to their open source project or further their code in some way, you know, now you've built that relationship. Now that person's gonna be in your corner next time you wanna apply for a role or do something. So that's huge. I, I love that, I love that idea. So, okay. go ahead. One, yeah, go ahead. Um, you've probably all heard the analogy of like a relationship bank account, like you share, a, you do something nice for somebody and that puts a deposit in the account. You ask them for something that takes pretend money out of them bank account and those engaged relationship managers are really aware of what that balance is with somebody when they're talking to them they know like hey you're brand new we're starting at zero i need to put some deposits in here and explain to you that i've tried something i'm not here to waste your time i'm here because i genuinely need your help and then the next time you come to approach that person you've got a positive balance already accrued with that person and that's 
kind of a transactional way of thinking about it, but at the same time, it's not a transactional behavior. You're building that relationship, even if you're mindful of the fact that you're kind of reducing it to numbers to make sense of it in your own head. So that's important because I think the point I want to make along those lines is, you know, just because something is transactional in that way does not mean it's inauthentic. You can still be yourself and you can still offer to help them in different ways and you know come to them with valuing their time and respect in that way. And uh, it can still be transactional and still be authentic in that manner. So Thomas, while you have the mic, I wanna ask you, because we will eventually have q and I promise. Like uh, anybody can ask questions at any point, just raise your hand uh, and we'll pass the mic over to you as well. Um, I, will, I will say the two books that I mentioned up here, I have ebook copies of those to give away. So the two people who ask the questions that are the most interesting will win those books. So, so there's I'm a little bit sure. out of incentive for you there. Um, but so Thomas, I wanna hit on this point because I know all three of us have had ideas about the same career talk. We've talked about it for many years. We've talked about ways to reach out. We talked about starting a podcast at one point and we didn't do it, but that's okay. Like much like many ideas in the pandemic that went the way of the dodo. Uh, but uh, generally, um, you we've talked about this concept specifically about circular mentorship. I don't know if you wanna expand on that a little bit because I feel like sure. that was very powerful and helped us in our journey. Yeah. I, I'm sure it's a term that existed before we came up with it, authentically on our own. <laughs> but the idea was to have a group of peers that were in you know, sort of the same career space as you were, that uh, you could trust and bounce ideas off of and uh, have this mutual exchange of mentorship and help and advice giving and receiving. Um, and it's really helpful when you can connect with somebody who's not your boss or your immediate coworker, because if you have a question about dealing with your boss or your immediate coworker, it's kind of hard to talk to them about that. They have, like, even if you're talking to your coworker about your boss, like they're managing those relationships. I keep saying managing relationships. I wonder why. Where's John Janelle? But um, huh. yeah, but it's that idea of an impartial person that I can trust to keep our conversations confidential that I can uh, get uh, advice from who is a primary goal is my success. Just like if it'll ask me a question, my goal is for him to be successful. I don't have a vested interest in his boss's career, his coworker's career, um, anything other than his success. And that's a very genuine way to talk to people that you know that there's no ulterior motive because it's gonna come around where, hey, I'm gonna need some advice and who can I talk to? Well. This person's already expressed their trust in me. They've already come to me for advice, and maybe I can give them. It doesn't mean everyone's qualified to give <laughs> great advice, but even just having that sounding board, that opportunity to um, kind of rubber duck and get through some stuff and sound it out, see how this sounds out loud, is is valuable. And it's sort of a, a trust relationship, a casual thing um, that can be really helpful when you're. Hey, is it time for me to? apply for this job. I don't know if I'm really cut out so for it. I'm pretty happy I've, where I am. I've so. actually done this, Thomas, with you three times now. So we've actually helped each other. And I think when you were transitioning into your last role, we actually had this conversation. And it's nice to have sort of a peer, you know, not necessarily somebody you have like a hierarchical relationship with an organization, you know, just to bounce those ideas off again. And, you know, they, they don't have a horse in that race, except for they're, they're in your corner, they're cheering for you to succeed, like all of us here, right? And I really like that part of it. And when, when Thomas first brought this concept out, I think we've, we have an internal DM group and we've been talking for like three, four years about this yeah, type of stuff, least. right? Yeah. yeah. Good, awesome. Uh, any questions from the Q&A? Again, uh, you know, feel free to raise your hand. Um, there you go, awesome, go for it. Do we, yeah, maybe, or we can just repeat your question. Thank you, Thomas. I think we get your stuff from Thomas. Yeah, Thomas, this is good. This is gonna be a side gig. Go ahead. Um, really for all three of you, but uh, Michael in particular, you were, you were talking about uh, that you really, you can, you can nail down your career to you know, certain conversations that you had. Um, outside of networking and some of those relationships that you've built, is there anything in particular that you could nail down as you know, a, like a springboard for your career that you know, led you to that next level or got you to where you are now? I absolutely can. So, oh, hold on. It's <laughs> the anecdote is coming. Exciting. So, how many people were not in their hotel room after 9 p.m. last night? That's how my career started. So, um, a long, long time ago, I got a 
I remember going to my first tech ed in 2007. And the first night, I didn't know anybody. I was just a school teacher from Wisconsin. And I remember going to, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to get dinner. You know, I'm kind of thirsty. So I went to the liquor store next door and I got a can of Foster's and a cigar and I'm sitting on the sidewalk and smoking a cigar and drinking a beer by myself. And I'm like, what's this all about? And I happened to get invited. I talked to a vendor. I got invited to a party and I ran into this group of people called the crew. And it was this people that basically what they did is they kept track of all of the vendor events and shared those in a small community. And we went to all of the sponsored things and got free booze, <laughs> free appetizers, free swag, all of that. And then I started a Twitter account for it to keep track of it. And it, it was just a way to keep people connected. There's that, a Facebook that, group too, right? that connected to getting into a TAP program for Longhorn at Microsoft, which led me to writing a book, which led me to meeting people from Train Signal to, to start creating my first video courses. Along the way, because I'd been to every tech at Ignite, I met people like Joey Snow and Rick Claus and Stephen Rose that led me allowed me to get to be where I was. And I got into the MVP program because of Steven and these people mentored me, but it was all from getting involved with this group and meeting these people. And just quite frankly, I created this Twitter account because I just wanted to share with everybody where the cool swag was at the event, where they're giving away these super cool things at their booth, go see it this, you know, sign up for this group and let's go hang out and have free booze or whatever you want and free food and have a good time and go to Top Golf and all these sort of things. It all came out of simply wanting to hang out with cool people and do cool stuff. Fast forward, I'm doing my, I'm working my dream job. I love every single day of what I do. I work for, with amazing people. I have an amazing leader. Um, you know, every day I, I super happy to be where I was. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I gave a career talk. It's it funny because I've given a number of career talks. And he hit on so many of the points that I had in my talk because they're all the same. Because it's all really, it's all common knowledge. It's all common sense. We just don't practice it. We don't put it into, into being. We don't. We don't, we don't make it work. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it, right, is just, um, you know, even putting it on paper, just sort of talking about it openly, you know, with your peers and stuff like that. And it's not an awkward conversation to have, you know. You, everybody has those dreams and, and, you know, talking about them and, and making goals around them and planning around it, it's, it's not a weird thing. It's good to do and it's healthy, but it, it's also something you have to nurture like any other relationship in your life. If you don't have a relationship with your goals and you're not checking in with them and moving forward, then, you know, that can uh, go the way of any relationship that you're not nurturing, for sure. So I think to round out your question, to, to quote one of the best presenters and speakers and storytellers I've ever met, Dr. James that used to work for Microsoft, do epic shit. <laughs> Just do cool things that make you happy and eventually that stuff the, the universe will do what it does, and it doesn't mean the role. I mean, my career path has gone. There was no trajectory to my career path. It was up and down yeah. and up and down and up and down, but oftentimes you have to go backwards to go forwards. But as long as you have that North Star of where you want to be and you're doing cool stuff and, you know, that sort of thing, I think you'll be successful. So hopefully that answered your question in a very long way. You bet. Thank you. Buddy. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you guys provide any insight on how one can move their team from 
an operational reactive mindset to a more proactive engineering mindset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here we go. Thomas, firstly, I will add before Thomas said anything, um, if we figure this all out, we'll let you know. Uh, because yeah. <laughs> honestly, if you know this answer, you could be the new CEO of every big bank company. Yeah, I, I think like really what you're describing is a cultural change and a cultural change of any kind within an established team in particular is really difficult because uh, you're overcoming that inertia of this is what we do, this is who we are, this is our kind of baked in identity. And when you say, well, we want to do this instead, you're changing that. And some people fundamentally identify with that identity really hard. Um, there's sort of the push and pull aspect of this. Um, th this was largely what I was brought onto the first team I worked on at Microsoft to do was help move out of this ops only reactive point and click mentality and into this declaring infrastructure as code, writing more automation, mature software development practices. Um, and you can't approach them with the stick and beat them and say, if you don't do this, we're going to have problems. This is not sustainable. This is going to crash and burn. You're going to burn out, um, even if that's all true. Um, the, the more powerful thing is the carrot. It's the uh, incentive. It's look how much better life is when you're doing whatever it is I'm asking you to do. Life is better when you're using source control. Yes, Git is a pain in the butt. And yes, it's so hard to understand and you're struggling with it so much. But look what happens when you need to go back a version and how much more satisfying it is and how much better it is. And these selling points, I'm not gonna sell you Git right now. <laughs> um, but, Corey can uh, do it. Sorry? I think he's good. Yeah. <laughs> but, Anytime I have problems with Git, I that's one of my popular blog posts is the six commands you need to survive and get. Um, but it's the, it, it's painting that picture of uh, that people are drawn to. What is the incentive? Why would I want to learn this? It's not because my boss told me I had to. It's because my life is improved somehow by doing it. And when you can figure out what's important to this person, oh, uptime of this service is super important to them. This is like what they hang their hat on. It's their top line on their resume that I'm responsible for keeping Office Online up for whatever amount of time. Um, here's a way you can make that better. Here's a way I can help you with that and improve your life. And uh, it's a two-pronged approach of knowing what they're motivated by and then figuring out how you can contribute that or at least frame your request in a way that serves that. Uh, and and painting them that whole picture of how much better things will be, how much faster they'll be, how much more empowered the people around them will be, uh, how much more time they'll get to spend with their family instead of getting paged, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so that's good. I have a real world example of that if you want it. Um, you didn't ask for it, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. The, uh, the, the idea that I had, so I had a colleague who was kind of new PowerShell, like, uh, you know, sort of uh, a little bit just tangentially and, and worked with it, but wasn't really committed in in sort of bringing it on. This is back in the day uh, in the trenches with this admin work. Um, and um, I knew that that colleague of mine was specifically um, always worried about and uh, handled a lot of the patch windows for Windows servers. Um, and so I had talked to him before about the ability of, you know, actually using, um, you know, a tool like a module like PS Windows Update or scheduled tasks or and operationalizing that and pushing that with a tool like Ansible. He thought this was all well and good, but he was sort of a gray beard. He's at that point in his career where he didn't really want to involve or do anything like that. So we spent some time, uh, another colleague of mine and I, I know we all have the gray hairs, so we're belying our age here. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so a part of that was I, I worked out what was important to him were these patch windows that he was always doing, and it took away from his time. So I basically built something that operationalized that in PowerShell and showed him, hey, look, we can actually control the sequence of these servers too. We can bring down uh, the, the front end web, and then we can bring down the back end .NET server, and then we can bring down the SQL server in that order and bring them back up in that same order. And look, this is all automated. This is the patch window. These are the updates that are gonna apply. You can blacklist, whitelist, whatever you want, um, and, and get to that point where you're, you're comfortable using that. So once we showed him how much time we could save with that, you know, that was the value. Everybody's looking to add value, right? You have to translate whatever you, your um, sort of goal is into value for them. What, what, what is value for them? And so once I showed him what value was, he was suddenly way more interested in doing that thing. So just an example. But thank you for that question. That's a great one. Any other questions out there? Okay, go for it. I know there's somebody back there too who's further away. So okay, I can't, I don't have that many slides. Oh, thank you. Yeah, make the trek. Go for it. Sorry. Um, 
At networking events, you talk about building relationships, how you really don't want to sell yourself in an elevator pitch to other people. What do you do if you're not afforded that luxury? Let's say you're laid off or maybe redundant and you have three months until your mortgage comes crumbling down. Uh, what do you do when you need a job and you have to push through that? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you for that one, because I know in the current climate, um, you know, um, with layoffs happening and rampant in all of our organizations, we've all suffered them and gone through them. So it's definitely a real, uh, real problem. It's like, you know, you don't have the luxury. You have a mortgage payment, like you said, and, and other things do, and you have a family. Um, uh, my hope in that, and again, I'll leave you guys to answer this too, because, you, you know, this is a sensitive topic and I can't possibly begin to say, okay, this is the one thing you can do. Um, uh, I think everybody here in this room, um, you know, uh, is here to help each other and practice that empathy. So I think having a network already built of folks that you can reach out to um, is helpful. I know that's not really, um, you know, something that you could have already, but like it's, that is what you lean back into in these situations. I had a position at one point in my career where, um, you know, my entire team was laid off but me. So I was the only guy doing the job I did. And you know what, I leaned hard on my network there and I was surprised with the amount the folks showed up and help me in that situation. So don't discount the relationships you make here. And even if you know somebody casually here or you've talked to us in this thing, don't be afraid to reach out. I'm happy to have a conversation in hallway track with anybody on that, in that scenario. So so yeah, I mean, the network really helps there. And I, I know it's hard to build it sometimes. It's hard to stay motivated um, uh, You know, when you're already in that position. Um, we had a colleague of ours in, in tech, I think he was on the PowerShell podcast, Adam Bacon, was it? Uh, who was, uh, who was um, sort of laid out from his position, had a limited amount of time to get a next job. He actually pumped out a bunch of modules on PowerShell and ended up and reached out to Andrew Pla and uh, Jordan and uh, you know said, hey, can I be on the PowerShell pod? He was on PowerShell podcast. And within that month, he turned around and got that position. So don't be disheartened. Believe me, there's plenty of stories like that out there. For folks who are proactive, it's never a bad time to be looking. You guys? You know, luckily I haven't been in that situation, but I meant like our, our employers have had layoffs. Yep. Yeah. On the other side of it, I recently, the former company that I was with in the last six months, they've done two major layoffs. And many of the people that were let go are people that I've known for years. And I know your question's coming from the side of, you know, if you're in that situation. I took the proactive to reach out to them, even though I don't know if I can help them. I engaged with a number of them to provide them support. So I think that's something we all can do when we know people that are in those situations. We may not be able to help them, or we may be able to, we might just not know it. So if you have people that are in those situations and you feel comfortable with it, I think it's I think it's being a great human to reach out to those people and just say, hey, I'm, you know, heard about what's going on. Really, if there's anything I could do for you, you know, feel free so that you can be there. And then you you leave it on them. If they choose to want, to want your help, they'll reach out. And if they don't, that's perfectly fine. But you've you've made that effort. So I think for those of us that are in lucky positions, I think we take that and we we take that gratitude and we we pass that on to others. That's a great point. Go ahead, Thomas. I'll give you the mark. But I will add to this because that's Mike reminded me of this. This happened recently. We went through a, a series of layoffs of, of our workforce, and one of my colleagues was made redundant. And uh, he's one of the smartest people I knew in identity, and uh, really great guy. And I reached out to him and I said, "Hey, look, I I posted, you know, his open to work on LinkedIn. And I reshared it with folks, and I, then I reached out to him and DM, and I said, "Look, this is really sucks." This is a bad situation that you're in. Is there somewhere I can help? I want to do something practical for you. And he actually reached back out and he said, hey, thanks for that. Like you really, just the kind words mean a lot. But he said, if you could write me an endorsement on LinkedIn of our experience and our professional experience working together, that would be huge for me. And I turned around and I like worked through it for a while and thought of something thoughtful and I wrote it. He's got a job now, like and not to say that I'm at all, he's got that of his own merits and talent. But like within that time, he reached out to, five or ten people based on that conversation we had he's like actually that's a great idea i'm going to reach out and he had 10 endorsements within like a week and so every, when a new employer is looking at that and the other colleagues have endorsed you suddenly you know you're looking a lot more appealing to an hr person right yeah i mean there's it's a human 
problem first, obviously, just to have that blow to your your ego and yourself. And there isn't really a, a magic silver bullet that, you know, oh, I need a job today. Well, uh, it, it's tough to come up with that. Um, but from the other side of it, when you see somebody you're close to who has been laid off or just somebody you know, that act of reaching out and supporting them as a person, like, hey, wow, that's really terrible. What do you need? I'm just echoing what you said now. Uh, can I, is there something I could retweet? Like I got a uh, hundred followers and maybe there's 90 of them who don't follow you and somebody will see this. Um, and it, it's that act of, um, you're not isolated in this alone. I care about you and I may or may not have a role I can hire you for, but I'm gonna support you anyway that I have the, the means to. Uh, it can mean a lot to folks who are in that position. Yeah, so show up for those around you for sure. I think we had and, one question. And Go not ahead. to Go ahead. paint too bleak a picture, but um, if you're there for others, in the hopefully extremely unlikely event that you ever need them to be there for you, people remember who did kindnesses for them and who came through for them when they were uh, in urgent need of help. Uh, and so if you ever find yourself, maybe it's not a layoff, it's something else, um, they, uh, they're more likely to come through for you as well. You talk about putting a deposit in those bank accounts of your relationship with them. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Thomas. You're, you're one of those guys for me. I would do anything for you, uh, for real. And and uh, we had one question left, I think, and I, I do want to yeah, get to it my, while we have time. So we have four minutes. So we're on the clock. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Um, appreciate your optimism about stuff. Um, <laughs> I understand you're, you guys are talking about relational relationship and transactional relationships. How do you deal with, you know, that negative net negative? relationship that you might encounter with people and how do you balance giving too much of your generosity and having people take advantage of that and what do you guys do to kind of not you know you want yourself to succeed you don't want people to to really propel themselves for your you know your power that you're giving to them yeah yeah it's sort of like the the time vampires are yeah, yeah 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 no there's definitely folks out there I'll say it. I turned 53 this year. So I've, I've been around for a long time and I've given a lot of myself and I've burned out and I've done all those things. And I've reached a point through years of friends like Thomas and reading books like and The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. And like when the stuff came up with Microsoft layouts, my wife was more worried than I was because I take an attitude of what's in my control and what's in my control is really what's in my head and nothing beyond that. So I make the choice to give people, I never give them my power, but I give them my time. And if somebody chooses to besmirch that or because I offer my time and I know how precious time is because it's the only thing we can't get back. So when I offer my time to somebody, I hope that they respect that. And if they don't, they're not gonna get my time again. But those people that respect my time and you know that it's a positive experience, I will always give that time. It goes back to when I was in, in the college, I wrote this thing about, um, my philosophy as a teacher was assisted Darwinism, which sounds kind of weird, but basically what it meant is that my students had to go at least 50% and I would go at 120 for them. Because I had so many people I needed to help, if they weren't willing to at least put in 50% effort, I can't help them. And so I think that putting it out there and giving somebody your time and providing things to people, that's always gonna be a net positive for you. What they choose to do with it is outside of your control. You can only hope that they do something positive with it, and if they do something negative with it. Your intentions were good. Exactly, your intentions were good, and you know, maybe you'll know better. Maybe I'll know better next time, too. Yeah, exactly, So exactly. Okay. 
Yeah, I can't top that either. That was a great one. I will say it's an awkward conversation to have to sometimes be honest with folks in that way. But you know, um, even if somebody's looking for help for you and you know they're just looking for the next step, um, you know, kind of kind of make them meet you halfway there a little bit. You know, if you can, I think that's the big push. And you know, have have that honest conversation. Be a little transparent and say, look. I'm not really seeing anything here from from your side. So if you could just, you know, like, you know, help me write this thing. You want me to refer you for this thing. You know, maybe maybe let's have a conversation about it before I just transactionally just write you an endorsement. Like, or even if you don't feel comfortable, I've had a conversation with a guy before where I literally said um, that, you know, uh, I, I don't know you well enough to write you this reference yet. Big I would John's going to cut you off. What's that? Big John's going to cut you off. Yeah, awesome. I would love to be able to, but I can't yet. And that's that's a tough conversation to have. Sometimes you have to have it. Thank you all for your time so much. One thing I want to throw out to everybody is thank you so much for allowing us to take your time. Yeah. That to me is the fact that you came here to listen to us is super important. Feel free to reach out to me at any time, michael.bender at microsoft.com. I will be happy to do whatever if I can help you with Azure, documentation, if you, career advice. I love to do that for people. So. Feel free to reach out. Mike is Slack. amazing. He's my so, spirit animal. No. He's a good, yeah, yeah. He's, you're all amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're all amazing. You're, you're all amazing. amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both for um, your time.